Afternoon guys, welcome to Skino's Kitchen. Now today's a very, very special event because I have a full fat Italian sitting in the kitchen with me. This is Joe from Prestige Audio and he has come down today to talk about him, talk about the business and give us an insight into why Prestige Audio do the type of jobs that they do. So how you doing Joe, you alright? Good thank you and thank you for the invite. No, thanks for coming down. It's this, this whole incentive of getting dealers down to promote their businesses has become a really big thing for us. We put the Terrific Tuesday out yesterday about promoting business and I have to say you are a keen person that has come on and is happy to be on camera and talk about this. I came for the food. You come, well, you come for that. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous today actually because I cook for people but I don't cook for Italians so I'm, I'm, I'm doing a simple weekday sauce. So the idea being is that we're all busy. You know, lockdown has started to lift. We're all going to be on sites. We're all going to be doing meetings. So for you, instead of coming in, ordering a pizza, you've got the opportunity to cook something within 15, 20 minutes, and it's a lovely dish. So we're going to do a nice, simple tomato and basil pasta, and we're going to go through some, some little techniques of how to make it really special. Cool. Can I get your Excited. coffee? Excited. Yes, please. I'll get a coffee. So tell us a little bit about Joe then. A little bit about Joe. Well, the trouble is it's been so many years it's too much to say <laughs> but my my passion has always been audio I love audio I used to play drums when it was in a band and I've always loved music and um, through one way or another I got into got into audio got into car audio many 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 moons ago and uh, 30 years now and it must um, be the garlic mate because you don't look uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it just, the passion drives knowledge, you know, having a passion for something, you want to know more about it, you want to understand what's happening, and and when you're designing, a, when, you know, when you've got a, 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 an audio system in a car that needs to perform, you've got so many problems, the speakers are in the wrong place, you've got glass everywhere, you've got reflections everywhere, and it's just really hard to get it right, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. Yeah. And, uh... Because you are pretty big in car audio, weren't you? Like the stuff you've done in the past. Um, massive, actually. Yeah, we had fun with it. <laughs> yeah, Award winning. But, yeah, I mean, you know, they, they used to be competitions where people would go along and get their car judged for the best install, the best sound, yeah. the loudest car. Um, so you've got the, pure, the more purist type client that wanted the best sound, and then you've got the chaps that just see how loud can you go, you know? Yeah, SPL competitions. Start breaking, breaking records on, on sound. Isn't there like volume. soundproofing competitions as well, like to contain that sound within the car? Not not then, I'm not sure if there is now, and I've not been involved with car audio for quite a few years now, but yeah. it was just then the best install, the best sounding, and, and the loudest. Mm. And um, there was a, a brand that was launched in the UK that ended up being number one brand in the UK called Rockford Fosgate and we represented that brand we were the distributor of that brand and one way of showing the world how good it was was it to enter the sound quality competitions yeah and um, we would win our fair share of trophies so as Rockford Fosgate as a brand all of our most of our clients would win a trophy of some sort more often than not they won the best sounding car in the UK, and then they would comp then we would take them to Europe and compete in Europe, and again walk away with first place trophies for the best sounding vehicles out there. But it all came from lots of experimenting, lots of work. We were in 1995. We were putting in room correction systems inside cars. Because um, the car audio world now has become quite. Um I suppose not normal, let's face it, you can't buy a Ford Fiesta with a double B Atmos system in it, but it's becoming a, a, a realm that is, the cinema type sound is being presented into yeah. a car that you can buy as a spec. Yeah, um, and the systems are very good now, so that that market hasn't gone away, but it's it shrunk quite a lot. So there's still a few people out there doing good work, um, but it's it's it, that market itself is wrong. But at the time, it was a cool thing to have. It was what the kids, you know, the kids would either tune their cars up or they would buy car stereos or both. That's the thing, man. I remember, like, I mean, I'm 32, but when I was uh, growing up, it was all max power and how, how, what can yeah. you bolt to your car and all this kind of stuff. But yeah. I feel like that world has changed now. It's become yeah. more about um, what you can get on a PCP package, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know and, and back then, in, in, in the mid-90s, people were putting £30,000, £40,000 car audio systems in their car. 
And that's a long, like, that's a lot of money if you look at it from a time scale. It was scale. more than the car in some cases. Yeah. In many cases, it was more than the car. Yeah. But it was their passion, you know? And then from doing it, often, very, you know, calibrating cars, designing cars, learning about acoustics, it's all, it, it's not university taught, it's real, it's the, the college of life learning. You exactly, know? yeah. And so I suppose um, the, the car audio side of things, though, is like transferable into why... I suppose you've gone into cinema, really. Well, audio is audio. Audio is audio, exactly. Yeah, and you have the same problems in a in a room that you do have in a car. Mm. And, you know, you end up listening to a lot of the, the tracks, you know, a particular music track, you listen to it so often. And I had a, I, I was in a fortunate position because our company, the company that I worked for then, also used to distribute very, very high-end home audio products. So mm. some of the best in the world. So I would run upstairs, listen to that track, on these very expensive speakers and extremely expensive amplifiers and very expensive uh, CD players, get a reference and then go back downstairs into the workshop, listen to it on the car and go, no, this isn't right. Yeah. And it was an immediate A-B comparison. So you learn and you find and you, and you just improve. Because I suppose from your perspective, having an ear, I mean, we spend our time talking about room correction in cinema and flat curve this off axis that and everything yes that's an extremely important element of the specification process but there is a kind of element of hi how are you doing this is uh mark rondo our purchasing manager joining us now <laughs> hi mark <laughs> <laughs> so essentially you can get it correct on paper but correct sound isn't necessarily good sound so having your ear to sit in that room listen Play around, try it, and also so subjective that you can really make a difference. Yeah, to well, the way that the quality. way that you measure sound is some. You know, when you if you if you me, if you measure something, it can tell you that it's a good response curve, but there's actually errors in the room, and you're measuring those errors. So when you listen to it, what you're listening to is not what you what you're you're getting back as a measurement. Yeah. Um, so then you have to be able to listen and go, right, that there, there's something else going on here. But that you, you can only learn that through experience. And mm. that experience then led me on to training other dealers in the UK how to design crossovers, how to design a, a speaker enclosure, how to tune a, an, in, an enclosure to a particular speaker, um, train people how to position speakers in, yeah. in, in a given car. And they're different depending on the car, on the centre console. Where the, the how the doors are, how the dashboard rolls behind. Was there any cars that were like the car to use? Like it was always seen as like the favourite car to put something into. The, the easiest cars to get right were hatchbacks. Right. The hardest cars to get right were cars with that were saloons and wide centre consoles. Okay. So and you had to have a strategy, a different strategy for different cars. So. You know, silly little things like there's absolutely no bass in the car and there's two big speakers in the boot. Why isn't there any bass? You open the boot and all of a sudden you've got a lot of bass. Yes. So it's the standing waves that you get in a home. But we had to understand what was going on, why it was happening. So now we know standing waves. We know what that issue is. Mm. So there's a particular example that you, audio is audio. Yeah. So, you know, we used to try it in a, we had a we had the training school of the industry, so that was the training school that people wanted to come to. Yeah, we'd have fun, but we'd also get down to the nitty gritty and formulas and maths came out and you know how to how to design, calibrate, and, do it and then we would do calibration classes back then. Yeah, and our cars, the proof was in the pudding. So we were winning a lot of trophies at the time and. Our biggest competitor was this company called Prestige Audio, who I knew the ownership of the company very well. There was three owners, um, and they they had a car audio installation company and a distribution company. Mm. So they sold their products, we sold ours. Their cars and our cars were the cars to beat. Yeah. And you know we all often joke about it even today that you know we always used to win more trophies, <laughs> and then we would aggravate them by having air horns so every time one of our competitors with a trophy <laughs> all of our competitors would have an air horn in their back <laughs> behind the back and then let off these air horns and then it became an air horn competition yeah <laughs> oh brilliant but we would have just a, such good fun and then there was a mutual respect that built up between my team and prestige teams so and that's how that know link barry become and bob, bob and, yeah. and all of the team there and um, a lot of people from this industry that do the custom work 
evolved some of them come from that world yeah you know? so there's a lot of people from that world that are now in our home industry because that's where our knowledge has taken us definitely so talking about your heritage side of things what i'm cooking is a simple italian tomato and basil pasta now yes it's very simple but it's easy to get wrong okay so um I do it this way. I'm not saying that every Italian does it this way, but what I've done is, guys, I've, I've put the, the basil and the garlic into cold oil, okay? So as the oil warms up, what it does is it infuses the basil into the oil itself. Now, the basil will start to brown off. Now, you can leave it in if you want to, but I prefer to take it out and then finish the dish with a bit, a bit of fresh basil at the end. But it just helps to sort of infuse all the oil. Then when the tomatoes go in, what we're going to do is we're going to cook it quite hard and fast because, like I say, this is a weekday sauce. You want to be able to cook it quickly and enjoy it, and it still tastes great. One of the secret tips to cooking a quick weekday sauce is get yourself one of these little gadgets. Right? So this is just a simple food meal. But what I've done is I've put my tomatoes into it, and now I am just milling it out and it's going to create a really nice kind of smooth sauce that will be easier to cook. But also where it's a smooth sauce, it kind of soaks into the pasta easier and it gives yeah. you a more covered. Because I'd be right in saying that in Italy, you don't swim in sauce when you're eating pasta. No. It's, it's a but coating. It also takes the seeds out, which exactly. takes some of the bitterness out of the sauce as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and highlights the sweetness of it. Now, I've gone for the Napolina... Um, chopped tomatoes all your advertising brands i'm advertising brands <laughs> obviously there is other tomato brands available out there um but i've gone for the napolinas but in terms of like a, an actual tomato to go for the san manzanos are the best simply because they have a really small seed pocket so obviously yeah reduces the numbers of seeds and bitterness in the sauce so i'm going to mill that out now i've done one tin should i do two no let's do one let's do one so nice and simple we're going to do that and then I'm gonna warm up this, but tell us a little bit about your life in Italy, a little bit about your family. Because I know your family, are they still currently in the UK for yeah, the whole COVID yeah, thing? Yeah. So when the whole COVID thing happened, me and Joe were actually talking about it and um, you'd managed to get your family over just before the whole yeah. mess in Italy. Yeah, but my parents, they um, grew up, they, they spent most of the, all of their adult life here in the UK and uh, retired back in Italy and would spend most of the year in Italy and then the, the, the winter months in the, in the UK. And when it's all started kicking off with COVID, I just, you know, when you've got a gut feel about something and I said, look, I need to get them back. And I remember speaking to you and a few of the team here, they're going, really, you're overreacting a little bit. And I remember nah. that conversation yeah. and I thought, look, I don't know, it's just not worth the risk. Nah. So we managed to get them back. And just as we got them back, not long after, it all went mad here. And so, yeah, I've still got my parents here with me now. Yeah, nice. it's time so for them to go back now. Oh yeah, enough is enough. I love them dearly, but they need to go. <laughs> so my nan, when she used to cook in the kitchen, she had a great ability to make a massive mess. I mean, the smells that came out of the kitchen and the food that came out of the kitchen was incredible. Nonna, nonna, but she would literally destroy the kitchen. And my mum would come home from work and she'd be like, "What have you done in my kitchen? Is it this? Is your mum the same? Is she taking yeah, over in the yeah, kitchen?" Yeah, and... yeah. Elbows, I'm in charge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the sad things that we've got, I have to mention, is essentially we're using UK sourced food. Now, there is a difference, isn't there? When you go to a proper Italian restaurant in the UK, like something like La Familia in, um, in uh, Kings Road, they've imported the salt, the salt they've imported the oil. Yeah. It's, it's those individual components that go into these dishes are what make Italian food the speciality that it is. And that's where as well it links in with what we do in terms of cinema is that it's all about having the right ingredients yeah. but it's also about the method of putting it together to deliver that overall yeah. experience and we've done quite a few jobs together haven't we with cinema yeah and we've enjoyed doing it sort of from demonstration stage to full case study out there in the yeah. world yeah um so big room's going to be good isn't it i'm excited excited to hear it yeah yeah so out of everyone that I've done demonstrations with. Joe is someone that has, well, I suppose from the car audio world and, and that kind of really importance of the science and the system. We've done a few demos, haven't we, where we're showcasing what SPL levels are like. Yeah. We were doing the soundproofing for that job, weren't we? And yeah. it works really well, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so the, um, the family though, whereabouts in Italy are you from? Because I'm from Rovello, which is, um, in Amalfi, it's quite high up in Amalfi, so I'm sort of near Naples, so I'm the dodgy boy that you don't mess around well, with. Well, Amalfi's not really Naples, is it? Well, it's pretty close. <laughs> it's on the coast. 
lovely part of the world. It rolls down, doesn't it? So the lemons. The lemons. The lemons. <laughs> Do you know what? This is a morning cooking. So we're filming this at the morning time. Now, I did want to bring in some limoncello, but I thought maybe by the afternoon, I don't know if you'd make it to your appointment later on. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a lovely part of the world. We're from Abruzzo, which is the other coast. Abruzzo. So near opposite side of Rome. Yeah, so that's the Marca region, isn't it? Yeah, so you've got we're just south of, we're on the border virtually on the Marca. Because that was, so in the kind of Imperial Roman times, they had a direct route from Rome to La Marca, because let's face it, La Marca is the, the real food sort of farming region of Italy. So yeah. having that direct route into Rome meant that the and food... And salt. And salt, yeah. Yeah, there is a salt called, there's a road, a salt, there's a road called Salaria. Yes. Which runs from Rome to our, our region. You go through the Grand Sasso, don't you? Yeah. Through the mountain, yeah. Yeah. And they used to obviously go over the top back then, but now now they, they put a big tunnel through it, which just shortened the time. It was four hours, it's now two in a bit. Yeah. It's so Rome. lovely, that drive, though, isn't it? Yeah. Going around all the mountains and Beautiful. the high roads. Yeah. Lovely place. So if you could go on a desert island then and only take one Italian dish. Mm, okay. What would it be? Stuffed olives. Ascoli olives? Yeah, that's... I was just about to ask you, you had an Ascoli olive before? Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, an Ascoli olive is essentially take the olive, they uh, pip it, and then they fill it with um, a mixture of lamb and pork mince, isn't it? They it's chicken and pork. Is it pork. chicken they do? Yeah. And then they um, essentially dip it in flour and egg, bread crumb it, and then it's deep fat fried and... It doesn't sound like much, does it? But oh, the taste is superb. Absolutely spectacular. If you ever get a chance to eat a, 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 an Ascoli olive, Olive Ascolana, if you can try one of those, I think. A lot of people don't like olives because they're bitter. Yeah. And once you have these, your mind will change about olives. Absolutely another level, isn't it? So. And the wine. <laughs> yes. Well, the thing is, when you go to a restaurant as well, you, you don't order a bottle of wine. No, <laughs> you order a what's jug. in, yeah, a <laughs> jug of what's the local stuff. And it is always absolutely spectacular. But uh, the, the lifestyle out there, the food that people eat, there's a reason why you see the hobbled old woman, who's probably 120, still walking uphill with 10 shopping bags, because yeah. they're strong-minded people. They, they, they love their culture. And, and there's reports of small areas of America where it's very highly concentrated with Italians and they all smoke, they all drink, they, <laughs> but they never have cancer reports or anything like that. It's one of yeah. these kind of funny things that goes on. But well, my dad's 84 and he still digs the back garden in Italy with a fork by hand. And when I say it's the half the size of a football pitch. <laughs> I can imagine. And he digs that by hand with a garden fork and he Jeez. digs deep. He's like a machine. With the um, he slowed down a bit now, as you'd expect, but he's uh, yeah, touch wood. He's back in it, right? So I have got asbestos hands, so I'm going to stick my hand in there. I'm going to bring the basil out now because I feel like that's infused enough, and then I'm going to put my tomatoes in now. Cheers. Cheers. So let's talk about some of the things that we've done together. Obviously, we've done the demonstrations. Um, when it comes to whole cinema systems, I would say that you're one of the, the, the guys that I've worked with most in terms of producing a start to finish full project. And I suppose, what is it that goes into that sort of setup? Because you do, as a company, you do full start to finish jobs. Yeah. It's not just I'm supplying the amp or I'm supplying a screen. You're always everything and the full project management. So what, what kind of goes into that as a deal? The, the process? Yeah. Uh, the first thing is obviously you meet the client, find out about their family, find out about the house that they're living in, um, find out what, a lot of people say, oh, I want a cinema. They've got a preconceived idea in their yeah. mind of, you know, cinema maybe 10, 15 thousand pounds would deliver a really high end cinema. Because they, they, they they don't know, you know? Yeah, exactly. And um, the, the, and the first thing is really get, getting, getting to know the family. And you can do that after a couple of visits. So, we, we, for example, we had our first meeting with a family last night. Mm. Your husband and wife were there, their children were there. So we know that they've got young children, what they're likely to want out of, the, out of a cinema room. Yeah. And then ask, you know, you know, understand what they want out of it. What do they want to achieve from that room? Yeah. Uh, are they just going to watch movies? Or do, they want, do they want to watch sport? Do they want to do some gaming? What do they... What, what's their goal? I definitely agree with the questioning and finding out about them as a family because it isn't just an off the spec sheet thing. Like, if you go into there and 
just keep saying, yeah, that's what we can do, yeah, that's what we can do. But then you find out that you specified a 235 screen and they're a massive sport family. You've just completely and utterly kind of gone against their preconceived. Yeah, they don't need a wide screen as the, their priority. is not a wide screen, you know. And people don't even understand what 235 or, you know, they don't understand any of that. You've got to, they don't know. All they know is the black lines on the TV, top and bottom, when they watch a movie. That's what they know. Yeah. You know, and it's keeping that language to language that they understand. Yeah, exactly. And um, so getting understanding of that, even questions of what sort of theme are you going to, how are you going to decorate the rest of the house? Can we incorporate a, a common theme into the room mm. as well? You know, the talk about, start talking early about the design, the aesthetics of that room. And from the experience that we have, when people look that they want to buy a cinema, what's in their head, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, is that they're, they're focused on what it looks like. Yeah, the aesthetics is really important. It's key. Yeah. yeah. So bring that in early that shows that our expertise is there. Again, because we used to rebuild half of the interior of a car, doing the room, do, you know, having a concrete wall and looking after raising the floor, doing the walls and ceiling, any custom work, we can do that all ourselves, you see. Mm. So we, we bring the design in early and then the next step is to show them what, what different cinemas, how they perform. And what they can You've do. got a test drive. You've got to have a test drive. So here, here's a question. Somebody comes to, someone calls a car show and say, how much is a car? Yeah. Salesman's gonna go, what car? Yeah? Because the salesman wants to give the right car to the client. And there's a hatchback, there's a two-seater, there's a convertible, there's an estate, there's an off-road. They're all cars. They're all classified as cars, but the cinema is the same thing. You, it's such you a need broad to understand. Subject. And yeah, and we're lucky because we have the knowledge. We know what different things do. We've experienced it, but our clients haven't. So they need a demonstration. So you've got to demonstrate it, and from that demonstration, you'll find that there'll be, you know, they'll they can't even explain. This cinema doesn't do it for me. Okay, why? why? Yeah, I don't. I can't oh, put words to it, yeah. but I know in my I heart. Of I heart. don't feel it. Okay, how don't you feel it? Well, it's not. It's not an emotional experience. Okay, or you'll get. You know, I can't feel it. In what way can't you feel? I can't feel it on my chest. Okay, well that's a telltale sign that they want more bass. Bass, yeah. And I so often find out of like frequencies, like the, the lower frequencies, is definitely an area where the customer kind of relates to more than anything. Yeah, yeah. And then in that, in that process, we've learned to explain to them what our, goal, what our goals as designers are and what's important to them. You know, the sonic balance, so the balance of the bass and the treble. The bass is the low frequency, the treble is the high frequency. People understand bass and treble because they've got bass and treble controls. Exactly, on and they can't, they've seen audience, it. Yeah. So they know. So, you know, that is that getting that balance right, dynamics, explaining that, imaging, the imaging of a system, the staging of a system, explaining that to them, because then all of a sudden you're arming them with information and they're listening for it and understanding, they'll understand that's not important to me or it is important to me. The yeah. decor, the quality of the picture. And there's a big difference from a 2,000 £2, pound projector and a 150,000 pound projector. It's a massive difference. People don't know that. Mm. And when you show that to people, some people are quite happy with the £2,000 projector, but yet some people want the £150,000 projector. A, they're in the fortunate position that, you know, their life has been good, they're in a position where they can buy it, but some people that have that availability, available budget, they don't need it. They listen, you know, they have a look, and oh, I don't need that. So it's getting a good understanding of what their needs and goals are. And I suppose budget is... For me, but obviously budget is really important, but also understanding that performance objective because like cars, certain levels of performance cost certain amounts of money. And as yeah. you get into the higher end of cinema, that exponential growth in cost does generally creep up quite quickly for maybe that minimal difference. But is that minimal difference in the law of diminishing returns for that client the most important thing? Yeah, it could be a waste. It, it could, could be an be. absolute waste for the client. And we've got to make sure that we deliver to meet their goals. But our job is to exceed, is target ourselves to exceed their goals. So when they get it, you get that smile, that magic smile. You know, remember the last project we got? Emily's project. 
and just a huge smile on on both their faces and then they're calling members of the building team to come down and have a yeah. listen have a look i think she said epic didn't she that was, was, um, epic. was her. that was a really enjoyable project to work on because when we did the demonstration she was quite non non-assuming kind of character wasn't she she came in after work one time for a demonstration and the i think the building people were with her wasn't yeah. they, at the time yeah and we showed off the system and then it was a case of getting her husband down to demonstrate and then obviously now that is actually available on um essential install magazine and our case studies page there's a whole yeah. case study about that project so it might be worth it's called spring it ponds if you want to check yeah spring ponds so you're also doing um i don't know about you actually but i'm seeing a lot of um sort of the residential sort of care home jobs popping up recently, like these kind yeah. of higher end, almost yeah. like villages. Have you had much to do with them at yeah, all? Yeah, we're working on, um, we're working with a company now that are gonna have 10 sites across London. The first two are going up now with a consultant on the project because one of the directors happens to be one of our clients as well. So he knows our work, he's happy with our work, he's confident that we'll look after him you know and his business and um yeah that's that's exciting you know yeah. it, it's a remember that when you're building for someone's home mm. it's their own property it's their home yeah and they will they will have a set of needs and goals when you're building for a um commercial venture and it, it depends on where what their goals as a business are it's the same yeah but then you're more commercially driven where you've got to be a bit more creative for them um sometimes the standards are very very high and sometimes they're less demanding but yeah you just got to do the right thing for the right client the right thing by the client what does the client what are the goals you mentioned earlier on about measuring the sound yeah. volume levels there was a budget to be met there and one of the budgets was how much amplification we're going to put in so we brought them here because they were talking about was it you was in the meeting wasn't you and one of the advisors said something about we're looking to hit 85 decibels and you went do you know what that actually sounds like <laughs> so i whistled 85 decibels yeah. <laughs> with a, an spl meter on my phone he goes that's what you're gonna get and they went oh dear i remember that demo because we had it in said, there. Right, we, we need to demonstrate the... to you music now at different volumes and then you can decide yeah what you do with the acoustics of the build so because that that demo they they sat there and they listened to 85 <coughs> decibels we played um it was queen wasn't it we were rocky we yeah. played and um they they were quite underwhelmed by it well because um, it's not very loud exactly is it? and they sat and they were happy between that kind of 90 95 100 mark weren't they but then we showed them what reference well, we, went to 90, we went to 95 in the end and there's a balance because there's apartments above the, yes the cost of soundproofing 95 decibels a, a given volume or 105 which is double the volume it's double the power so sorry double the volume yes so it's 10 db more you've you've doubled the volume the cost of insulating that acoustically from the apartments is huge so we had to balance cost of soundproofing to the apartments and performance of the cinema so that's where we add value because we understand exactly the detail of that. but that's that's a really important thing as well is, is it, you obviously adding value but also speculating on the knock-on effects at the beginning because it's all well and good designing a project and then saying oh yeah we'll change that we'll change that we'll change that well what is the knock-on effect of changing that how is it going to affect yeah. not just the system but the area around that Correct. system other things like that so yeah, it's, um, it's really important for clients to understand that. But let's face it, you do also get those clients that completely and utterly, I'm not being funny, don't care. They, they just want to have the hair on the back of their neck stand up. And that's why they come to someone like you with that kind of heritage to understand that you're going to deliver that as long as you've got the right information from them in yeah. terms of, I suppose, their yeah. personality. And, and, and there is the demo, you see. You've got to do the demonstration because you might be over delivering for the client you might be under delivering for the client you've got to understand what the client wants and the best way to do that is to put them in a thirty thousand pound cinema put them in a fifty thousand pound a hundred thousand pound a three hundred thousand pound cinema room put them in those rooms and see what they like give them a choice of what 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 do you get what is the return on that investment because remember they're going to spend most of our clients spend a lot of time in their cinemas mm. And that's a good it's sign. A big investment. That's a yeah. good sign. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, we're seeing um, 
in terms of projects coming through, I'm just going to test the pasta. In terms of projects coming through, we're seeing quite a lot of lot more media room style stuff at yeah. the moment. Um, we've always seen a lot of media room stuff, but I think from a perspective of um, dedicated cinema rooms, people are looking at their properties and thinking, right, instead of using that space completely, what I'm going to do is adapt what I have already. Yeah. And that's where things like projection brightness comes in. Having a, a, a multifunction type room, they're not going to be sitting in the pitch darkness yeah. watching a football match. So having that demonstration, it's showing a difference in projector brightness to then give them what they want is so important. Yeah, exactly that. And I think you're 100% right. Some, some clients have got two, they've got a, a dedicated cinema room and a media room. Yes. You know, some clients, they don't have the space, but they want that, in, that experience, but they want to have a multi-use room. So it's a, a living room during, during the day and at night when they want to watch a movie, a couple of, pre, you know, press of a button, lots of things happen and then you've got a cinema Definitely. room in that same room. They get the same experience. But do you, I believe that, like when I've said it before in demons, like when you go into a supercar showroom, you know what it's going to do. It's a bloody bright orange car. You're going to sit in it. It's going to tear your face off, and it's going to be really quick. That expectation is there, and I think when you walk into a dedicated cinema, you automatically psychologically have that expectation. When you go into a more of an elegant-looking living room style system but it still does that performance objective in terms of a cinema i find that much more pleasing to end users because they're like i'm in this extremely comfortable usable environment but i'm still getting that experience that i had in that dedicated cinema and i think even if you was to put the same system in both rooms same size room different layout psychologically people would prefer a different system based on the orientation of the space not just on the performance of the kit okay. yeah yeah oh, i think it's uh, it's Again, it goes back to the client. It's what the client wants. Some people want that experience of that dedicated cinema room where they go in. It's got it's it's it's, it's dark. You know, there's no reflections off the walls or the ceilings or the carpet. You know, silver. There's you know, we've been into cinema rooms that are dedicated cinema rooms. They've got cine they've got very light coloured silvery reflective carpet so when the screen comes on you're distracted by the reflection off of the floor yes and when you don't get that and it's all dark and there's very little reflections you get engrossed into the you're, you're there yeah you're, you're much more involved you know it really is immersive there's a lot you know immersive it gets used a lot and immersive is my opinion when you're when you're in you're watching a movie and there's a bit of a shock and everybody jumps back in there. Yeah. So they're involved. Do you know? remember when we used or to do the D-Box demo? You get a tear, you know, you get a tear from yeah. a client. We've had that where, you know, they listen to a little bit of, they listen to a, they're watching a video and there's a, a point that's emotional and they're involved in that emotion. Some people want that, not everybody does. No. But to get that involvement, you know, some people want a dedicated cinema room, some people want a media room, some people want both. Yeah. So, what I'm doing is I've taken the pasta out sort of probably three quarters of the way through the cooking process because what's really important about a good quality pasta is that you let the pasta itself soak up the sauce. So you probably see it so often that someone will make a sauce, then they make the pasta, they put the pasta on the plate and then they pour the sauce on top. Yeah. Fine. But you end up with this kind of like watery mess at the bottom of the plate. So what I'm doing is I brought the pasta out. And I'm just going to let that kind of cook for maybe another minute just so that it soaks in because we want the pasta to be al dente. Now, some people prefer it to be like more soft and cooked, but in Italy, realistically, what you want to do is get it to nice al dente, which is inside the pasta. If you look in it, you'll see a little core and you want that to completely disappear. But as it disappears, that's perfect. I'm just supposed to throw it on the water and if it sticks, it's, it's ready. Do you know what? <laughs> I used to do that, but the best way to do it is try it <laughs> yeah so i'm gonna do that now what i did just then joe as well is i added a bit of parmesan into the actual sauce itself so that it just gives it a different sort of body to the actual sauce but you were mentioning earlier about the ragu in bologna yeah. and actually adding milk to the sauce yeah yeah so bolognese sauce you know you've You've got to go to Bologna to experience Bolognese sauce. Yeah. It's the same, the ingredients are local, but what they do do is when they, you know, Bolognese sauce typically got minced meat, it's got tomatoes in it, but the true local, locally produced Bolognese sauce, it's, it's rather than being red, the sauce, it's, it's a bit brownish. Yeah. And it's because they put milk in the sauce. I, I, it was a discovery to me, and it became, you know, when I found out, it was like, 
once I found out, it was, yeah, everybody does it here. <laughs> Never but heard of it. Is it, it must be something to do with like the tenderizing of the, um, of the meat. Cause obviously when you do like, like you can do like buttermilk chickens and things like yeah. that, obviously you leave it soaking and it gives you that kind of nice, um, tenderness to the meat. Yeah, possibly. All I can say, it tastes, it tastes really good, you know? <laughs> it's authentic. Yeah. But, um, all right. So I'm a bit of a fancy pont. So, um, use a meat fork. Learned this from um, uh, Tom at Isotech, who was on the last cooking show. He's actually a, a chef himself, or was previously, before he joined our crazy world. And a meat fork, just give it, how do you make pasta look pretty? Well, use a meat fork. So, let's finish it off with a little bit of basil for the... Very nice. Would you like some more Parmesan on the top? Oh, yes, please. You can never have too much of that. Can can never you can never have so too much Parmesan. Let's give it a little bit of a... Well, and then a bit of black pepper. Of course, yeah. Do you like chilli? Yes. I, I normally have like a chilli oil afterwards, like put a bit of, bit of that on there. Um, and I said to George actually before we started filming this, one of the things that we need to put on expenses is a massive pepper grinder. <laughs> <laughs> I just need a huge pepper grinder. We call it the weapon at home. Yeah, exactly. If you ain't got something that you can hit someone with, use a pepper grinder. <laughs> There you go, my friend. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch, early lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, guys, um, there is some in the plate, but when we finish filming, you can fight amongst yourselves to get that one. So um, this is the part when you taste it, say it's amazing, off camera you go, call yourself an Italian. <laughs> I wouldn't dream of it. Grateful that I'm being fed. <laughs> definitely, definitely. We should start doing this, actually, as a demonstration process. Like, let's have a sit down chat, cook some food, and then go in and enjoy the cinema because I think that's really important. It's not just about pumping someone into a dark room, playing them with Mad Maxi and going no, to buy cinema. Not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's have a little try. Tuck in. Thank you. Thank you again. Oh, thanks for coming down, Joe. Thank you. Oh dear. All right. Weekday sauce. Bon appetit. Mm. Good. Pasta's nice and now dente. We're it's happy. excellent. Thank you, Joe. So guys, Joe Carey, director, Prestige Audio, does it very well. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming down, Joe. Thanks very much. Guys, we'll see you very soon for the next episode of Ski Nose Kitchen. Again, please make sure you reach out to us on our social media platforms, on the info at Pulse Cinema's email. We'd love for you to join us like Joe has and get an experience of you, what you do in the industry, and how you make yourself the great business that you are. So have an awesome day. Cheers. Cheers.